it isn't easy, but it's me. We live in a society built under the shadow of empire. By 1914, the collective West controlled 85% of the earth as colonies, protectorates, dependencies, dominions, and commonwealths. All the words for empire, which greatly surpasses any ancient society. The problem is that a lot of the analysis of pop culture about empire, imperialism, and colonization is usually done by white people TM. With a very in my opinion, narrow understanding of the longer standing issues concerning what it means for colonization to exist, not just physically, but emotionally, how that trauma is passed on for generations. It also often wants to distill the great evil of empire into one force that can be overcome and defeated instead of really taking the time to understand where that evil comes from, which if we're gonna be talking about it in a theoretical way is in my opinion, very important and valid. My goal in this video is not to create the definitive take on this issue. It is very broad. <laughs> Literal academics could cover it and I used to be an academic, but I gave that all up to just do pop culture. However, since empire, imperialization, and colonization is something that is popular in media, and since Dune is coming out soon, and the discourse around that is about to be so I wanted to create a foundation with which we could begin to get people to ask better questions. That's really my goal. Not to say that you can't have your feelings about this topic and it can't be divisive, but to ask better questions about this topic, especially if we are all going to engage in language about it in fandom. And I wanted to talk about children's cartoons mainly because a lot of children animated series have had this issue come up naturally. And I just thought it would be a really interesting way of kind of highlighting how we start teaching the language of empire and imperialization and all those kind of things and the imagery of it and the aesthetic of it at a very young age and how that can often be confusing because the narrative may be using it as a metaphor versus a literal story about empire and colonization. So I'm gonna focus on four shows to discuss this topic. Avatar The Last Airbender with a smattering of The Legend of Korra, Star vs. The Forces of Evil, Steven Universe, Steven Universe Future, and She-Ra and the Princesses of Power, which there will be spoilers for the latest season. Go watch She-Ra. It's amazing. <laughs> In Edward W. Said's 1993 book of literary criticism titled Culture and Imperialism, he states that imperialism means the practice, the theory, and the attitudes of a dominating metropolitan center ruling a distant territory. Colonization, which is almost always a consequence of imperialism, is the implanting of settlements on distant territory. In a modern context, when we are talking about empire, we are talking about most of the time, Western imperialism, especially the empires forged by Britain and France. Although Belgium and other places definitely need to go take their L's because they did that shit too. The concept of empire, especially a dark cloaked fascist one, has become a common thing in our pop culture imagery. While we do understand that imperialism is not good, despite, you know, the United States constantly propagating in it, but. <laughs> Narratively, we also just love the idea of the little guy, the revolutionary, the freedom fighter, trying to protect his little small town and his beliefs and his, his ancestor, his homeland. This is a rebellion, isn't it? I rebel. But we have also been taught to have a very heavy fear of anarchy so that we don't go full French or Haitian revolution. That's a little too real for folk. So in our minds, we are always balancing out these ideas of freedom, individualism, and self-actualization with our fear of upheaval, the desire for stability, and the idea that one culture, and this is kind of the uncomfortable truth, there is an idea that a lot of us are taught that one culture can be superior to another. And it is within that vacuum that these narratives, cartoons, and everything else exist in. There are two ways that I often see empire used in media. In the literal sense where you are the, you know, Luke Skywalker type defeating the evil empire. And colonization comes to a full stop. Then you have where that evil empire is very much the stand-in for something else. It's a metaphor for a larger, more societal issue. 
And that's when things get messy and that's when we need to start asking better questions. But let's get into a really literal example on our first go. <laughs> what the Avatar franchise gets right about imperialism and colonization is really the brutality of the act, not just physically but emotionally. The Fire Nation has committed genocide as a way of initially furthering their attack and empire, and at the finale they are completely willing to do it again. We see the Earth Kingdom nations are either completely ignoring and isolating themselves You're in ba Sing Se now. Everyone is safe here. Or they're fighting to preserve their way of life and dealing with things like internment camps and just a constant fear that their way of life is going to go away. No one is completely untouched by the war. Knowledge is lost, as we see with the Southern Water Tribe that have no water benders to teach a new generation of potential benders how to fight, defend themselves, to actually use their techniques. They had no problem kidnapping and killing waterbenders, most notably Katara and Sokka's mother, who wasn't a bender but was giving up her life to protect her daughter. Avatar is great at showing the lengths of cruelty that an empire can create and how it attempts to sort of breed ideas of inferiority by removing cultural knowledge and skills. They, they kill you by not just murdering you, but also taking away the things that you could pass on to other people. In the episode, The Southern Air Temple, is where we really get to see, at least for the first time, the brutality of the Fire Nation. And the show really is mature enough to let us know that they meant it when they said genocide. We see the ruins of what was lost. It is traumatic, especially for Aang, but it's realistic. However, what Avatar does fail at is dealing with the aftermath of what should happen to the Fire Nation. When we end the series, Zuko, who has gone through his entire redemption arc, is Fire Lord. And there is an assumption that he will be working to help undo the damage that was done by the Fire Nation to the other nations. This happens not in the series itself, because again, the point of the series was to just defeat the big bad, that was Ozai. We get that information from the comics that connect that series to the Legend of Korra. And they are... A mess. It's Republic City, which is where a good chunk of the Legend of Korra takes place in, is former Earth Kingdom territory that was a Fire Nation colony. After the war, Zuko starts what is called the Harmony Restoration Movement, and it was a campaign to basically take Fire Nation settlers and removing them from these settlements and giving that land just back over to the Earth Kingdom, which, you know, makes complete sense. There ends up being a huge conflict between Zuko and Aang, which only serves as a reminder of why the Avatar should be a neutral party and not really be friends with world leaders. But that's another issue. At this point, Fire Nation citizens have married Earth Kingdom people and have mixed race children, essentially, that basically feel like they're being asked to choose. Fire Nation people have also been born there and it's the only land that they've ever known. It's a very complicated situation that has a lot of allusions to real life and the narrative decides to handle it by sharing. I have always felt really underwhelmed and like frustrated by the solution to this issue because it just smells very imperialist. <laughs> like it oversimplifies all of the things that the Fire Nation has done, which has done irreparable harm, irreparable harm. After spending so much time establishing what they have done, people we know, characters that we enjoyed, died by the end of book two due to the machinations of the Fire Nation. And yet, when it really comes time for the Fire Nation to have to pay the consequences of what happened, there is a desire to sort of shift the blame away from them as if they don't have any skin in that game. Just because we spent time in book three showing that not everybody in the Fire Nation was bad doesn't mean there shouldn't be consequences for these Fire Nation settlers. I understand that these Fire Nation colonizers feel attachment to this land. If they were born there and they met people they love there, that is all very valid. But they are there as part of the Fire Nation's attempt to ethnically assimilate Earth Kingdom people into Fire Nation society. There is no language of restorative justice. A Fire Nation citizens, if they want to stay there, maybe paying higher taxes or something else to hold them accountable. They are not there by accident. They were there to create a settlement to displace the native people of that land in an act of war. But this is what happens when you want to be anti-imperialist narratively, but you also make a main character who ends up being the figurehead of that. 
imperialist society. I'm so sorry, Zuko. With Avatar, it kind of makes this conclusion that by getting rid of Ozai and installing Zuko as the new leader makes the Fire Nation okay again. As if Zuko did not actually spend most of the series being an agent, even unintentionally, of the Fire Nation Empire. Let's, let's be clear, the Fire Nation committed genocide against the Air Nomads, colonized waves of the Earth Kingdom and put some of them into internment camps, was responsible for the death of the heir to the Northern Water Tribe, <laughs> kidnapped and murdered citizens of the Southern Water Tribe, and in the end, because they have a good teenager ruling them, in like less than 50 years he can get a statue of himself in the square on land that his family once occupied? That's... Ugh. Again, this is not a slam against the show or the character of Zuko, who I do like overall. But we cannot forget that despite the Asian and indigenous inspiration for this world, it was still created by two white Americans. We love this trope of like the one member of the royal family who gets it and rebels against his or her family for a noble cause, right? But when in the history of modern colonization did any reform of slavery or imperialism or colonization come from the monarchy down? And if I'm wrong, let me know down below. Let me know who the, who the woke monarchs were at. But if we don't see that in history, why are we always telling this rebellion narrative through the perspective of a prince or a royal person and not just an average person? human being. If we wanted to show the Fire Nation citizens not being culpable for the Fire Nation's actions, then like why didn't we just sit with a regular Fire Nation kid then? Why was it the Prince of the Fire Nation? Food for thought. Moving on. really enjoy it a lot of Star Wars' The Forces of Evil as a Magical Girl stan, as y'all know. It definitely spoke to my taste, and I think that it had a very interesting political narrative. Until... <laughs> until it remembered that it was a Disney XD show and then decided to be all about shipping and relationships that I did not care about, and it broke my heart. So the show is about a magical princess named Star Butterfly from the Kingdom of Muni who is sent to Earth because she is a hot mess who keeps destroying things by accident. Uh, and the world of Muni is inhabited by monsters and humans who are humans. I'm gonna call them humans. There's an episode in season one called Mutependence Day, which I think is like the 20th episode, where we are told about how the people of Muni defeated the monsters that were infesting the land. And it's Marco, who is Star's best friend, love interest, and co lead, who, who looks at the pop up book that tells this story and is like, huh, it seems as if y'all invaded and murdered the indigenous people of this land and then rewrote yourselves as the heroes by making them seem like savages and monstrous. Wow, I can't believe history just gets written by like whoever the fuck wins. Weird, who decided that? As the show progresses, we realize that the monsters of Muni are victims of basically years of mistreatment and marginalization from the humans, and especially from the monarchy, from the butterfly monarchy, who have helped perpetuate all of this mythology and dehumanization, which is weird to say because they are literally monsters, but you know what I mean. It's a metaphor. It's a metaphor. Now this has been so severe because what we end up finding out is that one of their queens, one of the former queens of Muni, Eclipsa, did fall in love with a monster named Globglor. He's, he's very attractive. And they had a half monster child. Because she did this, they imprisoned Eclipsa for centuries, replaced the true heir of the throne, her child, with somebody else, and allowed the monarchy to run on this lie that is effectively stemmed from racism and xenophobia. We can you imagine if the power of magic fell into the hands of a monster? And what is so interesting, obviously, is that everything that I just said can tie into a real-world conflict or racism. You know, the, the very fact that they usurped someone who would have made legitimate changes, stole her child, and then tried to erase that history entirely is just so fascinating and good and one of the things that made Star such a really great show for those first three seasons. At the end of the third season, Star decides to give up the throne and restore power to Eclipsa, who has been resurrected and is like the rightful queen. And their goal is to then bring peace between the monsters and the humans. Until it just gets very shenanigan-y. They 
make Eclipse a bad queen in the sense that she's very incompetent. She's always neglecting either one group or the other according to people. She has a very bad reputation in the kingdom and Star is always having to pull her out of scrapes. We also will spend time seeing the Miamans get upset by having her there and helping monsters and you get this feeling like the story wants to focus more on this but there is but also keep it light because it is for children, it is understandable. But what ends up happening is this sort of subtext that Eclipse is incapable and part of what makes her incapable as a ruler is because she cares too much about monsters. And because she cares too much about monsters and taking care of her husband and her child that it ineffectively makes her a bad person. So we don't even have the person who has been progressive from the very beginning shown to be competent. But there are good episodes that deal with this. There's an episode in the season called Cornball where Star hosts a game of Cornball and mixes the teams of young humans and young monsters to kind of show that there's a possibility of integrating this world. Sadly, while this issue is important and the most interesting part of Star, what ends up happening is that the romantic drama in the series envelops the entire thing. Like in the middle of like literally dealing with the aftermath of racism, we'll have episodes about who's whose soulmate and who's crush and dating and it's just like, it's just boring because they're all 14 years old anyway. Who cares if you wanna date your best friend or your demon ex? Like obviously demon ex. And this plot irrelevance ends up affecting the final conclusion of the show. During this final season, we see that the humans are sort of trickling out of Muni properly and going into a monster free settlement that's ruled by Star's mother, Moon. And we see the former hero of Muni, Mina, who's like a, you know, clearly a Sailor Moon character inspired, uh, is kind of resolved to kill all the monsters and create these giant mechas in order to slaughter them by like the hundreds. And Star's ultimate solution is to get rid of magic because the mechas are, are sourced by magic. The problem is that like, the reason for the inequality is not magic. And most humans don't even have magic anyway. The issue is like systemic, internalized racism and xenophobia, not magic. <laughs> Much like Avatar, Star wanted to promote ideas of equality by like saying things like, if young children from both sides got to interact, we could create a future generation that's full of equality. But that's fine because, I mean, we want that to happen. It's a children's show. We want to have that issue. The show also wants to present this idea that the humans are just misguided because they've been told monsters are evil their whole time and that's it. But for a show that goes to such lengths, to explore the structural and historical legacy of what happens, it feels really lazy that it regresses to this very oversimplified message of accidental racism and they just need to know better, which is exhausting <laughs> because we know it's not true. Even with the finale, the biggest thing that concerns Star when she decides to get rid of magic is not the implications for the monster human relationship, it is is she gonna be able to see her boyfriend again? I'm like, girl, we're talking about structural inequality. Like, what are we doing this? And it's also very weird because Marco, who's this, you know, her secondary love protagonist, all that, all that thing I said earlier, is Mexican. And he really doesn't get to have any commentary or insight. It's again, this kind of common trope of like wanting to talk about marginalized issues, wanting to have heroes there. But the people who should be the focus of it are not there. So that would make it, I guess, too real. The biggest disappointment for me of Star is that it went there so hard and then stopped. And I'm not really sure why. And I gotta say, for a show that was made so recently and during the Trump administration, because I think it, it's, it ended back, in, back last year or so, the fact that it ends with this kind of idea of like, well, if we all just get along, it's like, girl, This is a section where people are gonna start debating me. I encourage it, I accept it, let go. Steven Universe's ending is very polarizing because we had the diamonds who throughout the series have been held up as these like terrifying fascist like colonizing dicks basically. And at the end of the first part of the series, the diamonds realize that they're the worst and they span their empire because they wanna be in a healthy relationship with their 
sister nephew. I have seen people say that this is erasing the fact that they are fascists. I think that Steven Universe understands better than most shows that what oppressed people need is to A, be free of their oppressors, obviously, and B, to have their former oppressors pay uh, money, all of it. You see what we did to this country? They stole from everybody. Steven Universe understands that being completely wrapped up in a cause, especially a cause for freedom, like a righteous fight, can completely warp and change your whole perspective and identity and all that kind of stuff. Like, not to totally switch shows, but in Deep Space Nine, one of my favorite characters, Kira Norris, you know, her entire story is about going from someone who was a freedom fighter, a terrorist, really fighting to to free her occupied homeland from colonization, but that has completely affected her mentally, her ability to connect with other people, to trust other forms of government, to force other outside, anything. So all of that stuff is really complicated. Steven in Steven Universe Future is also forced to deal with the kind of physical pain that he has put his body through that is now manifested in his ability to deal with any sort of psychological strain. He treats every single moment of anxiety like a life and death situation because he's constantly been in life and death situations. This leads to a very intense emotional crisis for Stephen and he lashes out until he's really able to reconnect with his family again, which I think is exactly the kind of thoughtful communicable care that is really important. In fact, when doctors are talking about treating child soldiers, it is necessary for them to have support from their families, from their community to be you, to be brought back into society. Is the kind of emotional empathy that is important when we're talking about victims of empires. It is frustrating that people call Stephen annoying for being a scarred child, it's like, again, y'all have all this energy for the diamonds and talk about fascism, but you don't want to actually deal with having empathy or kindness to someone who has been an ultimate victim of that and how he's lived his life trying to fight it. That's one thing. Let's address the issue with the diamonds. And again, this is my opinion. I think a lot of people feel that by making the diamonds redeemed, that it means that Rebecca Sugar who is a non-binary Jewish person, is making excuses for fascists, is a Nazi sympathizer, a Nazi apologist, or is saying that we need to like be kind to fascists. Maybe instead of going to that conclusion, right? Maybe we can ask ourselves this. Are the diamonds meant to be Nazis? We say, we, we say fascism a lot, especially on the internet. And fascism is, at its core, a political theory that requires things like reactionary issues that they're, that they're coming after, an ideology, none of which the diamonds have. If you read sort of the Ur fascist and it outlines these kind of 14 points, the diamonds don't really hit those points. The diamonds are, are, have no competition in the government, and I don't think they're a metaphor for Nazis. They are a metaphor for a conservative family. And I get why this can be confusing and it's part of why I have an issue with fascism and all stuff as metaphor anyway, but it's like, you know, the diamonds, they have ultimate control, use it for evil, they punish people who don't conform to their standards and they don't support fusions, which is kind of a metaphor for same sex relationships or interracial relationships. And while I understand the pivot to just calling that fascism, that kind of control happens in totalitarian empires, period, regardless of the ideology, but also if you view it as this is Stephen's family, right, which they are, what you're getting is not a narrative about, a, about this boy and these people fighting literal fascists. They are fighting sort of like a metaphorical manifestation of that conservative, basically it's like they're fighting their Trump-supporting parents. But it's about the wish fulfillment that what if your parents could change? What if the toxic members of your family, if you could really connect with them and they could understand where they're coming from, would see you, acknowledge you, recognize you for who you are? I mean, there's a reason why the indicator that the diamonds have changed is when they stop calling Steven pink and start calling Steven, Steven. I don't think that the diamonds are redeemed. They're just not totalitarian anymore. Like. 
I feel like we are so quick to say so and just had a redemption arc or they were redeemed. Like they can be on redemption journeys. They could be on the path of redemption. But I don't think that because the diamonds are nice because of Steven, that means they're redeemed. It means that they're not actively <laughs> being totalitarian and colonizing anymore. I like that when we do see the diamonds, they are helping to fix the damage they have caused. You know, like they, I don't think that they have money to pay actual reparations, but they're using their powers, their abilities, their time, their labor to help these people. And that's what they should be doing. They are undoing the, the war crimes they committed. What other fucking nation does that kind of thing? You know, like that's what I mean is like, the, this is why I take issue with the idea that Rebecca Sugar is doing a bad thing. Allowing those who are responsible for doing harm to actively work towards correcting that harm. That's important. That's the reason people ask for reparations. That's the reason why people ask for these empires to be held responsible for what they've done to certain commonwealths because they are supposed to. And I'm not saying that this isn't somewhat problematic and that people can't take issues with these things. I just wanna point out that there's this automatic Western push to think every time that we're talking about fascist imagery that we're talking about explicitly Nazis. And it's like, there are literally other empires. There are other kind of fascists. Are there stories that explicitly tie their fascist metaphor to Nazism? Absolutely, duh. But I don't think it's a point of Steven Universe. I mean, like, I mean, that's the reason why the show always fixes things through emotional conflict resolution, not through violence. Almost, they have never killed anyone. And in fact, for the most problematic character is probably Jasper, who is probably the most fascist of them all. <sighs> oh, Jasper, you're a, you got issues. For those growing up different in a family that's conservative, religious and driven to perfectionism, that can feel like fascism when you're a kid. That is the experience that I think Sugar is talking about and speaking to by using the diamonds in this metaphorical way. And also they could be leaning onto this metaphor and symbolism because Sugar is Jewish and American. So when you see a character do a weird hand symbol to pledge fealty to another power, we understand what this is means and we, put that into our brains. It's an imperfect thing. And I have issues with that way that we use fascist imagery anyway, but we have one more show before we can get to that conclusion. <laughs> Drink a little bit. Drink a little bit more tea. Now, there will be spoilers for the series finale of Shira. Catch her forever. We stay in a complicated female in Shira, the Horde, which is led by Hordak, has set itself up as a kind of totalitarian expansion to the big bad Horde Prime's empire. The native population of Etheria have been fighting Hordak for what I guess is about 20-ish years, less than 20 years still. It's, it's enough, I mean, it's not great, <laughs> but it hasn't been forever, but it has been for a significant period of time. When we meet Horde Prime, he is this cult leader, who runs this galactic empire with clones of himself that serve as his subjects, which is very, Freud would love that, honestly. And he has mythologized himself into some sort of unbeatable, all-knowing God. There are scenes that you will see him call for his, subject, his subjects to be cleansed, to be purified. And he collects trophies of all of the old world he's conquered and we even see him call any sort of difference defective. And Hordak has often been coded as a lot of people as a person with disabilities. So there's a whole issue with how Horde Prime really seeks to assimilate everyone into this one hegemonic sense where he is, he is the blueprint. <laughs> Now, Horde Prime is viewed by a lot of people as Space Hitler. And in comparison to the diamonds, he does hit a lot more of the fascist markers. But Noel Stevenson, the creator of the show, has stated that Horde Prime is based on cult leaders, as I called them one earlier. And what makes this interesting is because of the way religion and colonization deeply intersect, because boy, 
do they? Bringing the light of Jesus and the truth faith to people was something that was used to validate slavery. They were godless heathens and therefore it was a mercy to unleash punishment upon them and instill them with nightmaric horrors and completely destroy them and their people. Well, not destroy it because we out here and we thrive in, but you know, that was the mentality. And it was good because under the light of Horde Prime, I mean Jesus, all is good. Now this is interesting because if you look at Hordak from that perspective, not someone who was an alt-right fascist baby, but someone who was <laughs> Someone who was indoctrinated from birth into a rigid religious system that bred out individuality, that saw any kind of disability as a blemish or a flaw by, or even satanic, and that told you that forcing your ideology onto someone else, that you are serving God. That makes Hordag's arc more interesting and more compelling than that he's just a fascist. Especially if you watch it from the beginning and you realize the way in which Hordak is highlighting his individuality even as he is claiming to spread, you know, Horde Prime's life. I built an empire for you, brother, blah, blah, blah. Okay, whatever. Even in the last episode, there is sort of this flashback moment where it can be sort of implied that Hordak wanted Adora to be there because maybe he saw her as a way of finally defeating Horde Prime. I don't know. That last part is just my theory. No, well, if I'm right, let a girl know in the DMs, they open. Now, none of this is to say that Hordak is not part of an imperialist system. Religion, especially Abrahamic faith, has definitely been used to imperialize and destroy and harm people. He is definitely a problem. However, when you consider the fact that Noelle herself, who is a lesbian, grew up in a conservative Catholic household, it makes things a little bit more fleshed out. Now, I know that a lot of people are like, death of the author, what the author says doesn't matter. Author's intent doesn't really matter. That stuff doesn't affect how they view the series. But someone like myself, who reads literature through a new historicism perspective, some of y'all may not know this, but I have a master's degree in English and my concentration was literary theory. So I may not know how to pronounce words, but your girl is smart technically, technically. To me, that insight and that perspective makes it more interesting to me. Not only does it explain why Hordak, wrong Hordak, and members of the Horde in Assyria are treated sympathetically, it's not because Noelle is sympathetic to Nazis or fascism, it is because she is sympathetic to people who grow up in abusive systems where they are told something is innately wrong with them, that reduces their value, and that's so good so much better to read as a narrative. And this is an important narrative to have for young people because we grow up in societies that are oppressive. And those systems teach us how to be oppressors first, especially when we already have trauma on top of our already existing issues. I mean, that's what I find interesting about Shira, that it has this sort of nuance and how it treats the people on the ground. I do understand people being like, well, does that mean Hordak is redeemed? I think this comes from an idea, like I said before, that redemption is one action. R R Hordak rejecting his program, Hordak! <laughs> Hordak rejecting his programming and killing the figure of his oppressor is a powerful moment. It doesn't erase the fact that he did terrible, terrible things. It does give him narratively the opportunity to now do good things. He can be redeemed because he has learned that what he was taught was wrong. If the audience wants to accept that or not, that's up to them. I, you know, I'm not gonna sit here and tell you to like Hordak, but I think if you view Hordak through his religious metaphoric lens, it shapes more of how I think Noel wants us to see Hordak than like a Kylo Ren mini Hitler type. Now again, this is also imperfect. <laughs> Part of what made Frozen 2 such an excellent sequel to me and why it has such a great message about colonization is because that message was the intent of the story. They spoke with the Sami people and the central conflict dealing with the consequences of white European abuse of native and indigenous populations is baked into 
the text. It is not a metaphor for anything. It is instinctively, you know what they're talking about. And also by making Anna and Elsa part of that indigenous heritage gives them a deeper tie to the culture and allows them to now be avatars, in one case quite literally, of this bridge. And it didn't have to compromise destroying the dam because the magic allowed both to exist. But now on the terms that the Nothundra can now agree to and have always wanted. They wanted the dam destroyed, they got the dam destroyed. Huzzah! It does wrap things up neatly because it's a Disney film, but it does not wrap things up without making it very clear that it was the colonizers who had to give up something in order for peace to happen. The responsibility is on them. The problem with all of the shows I've mentioned, which I love all of them. The problem with all of them, especially the latter two, in the context of this conversation, is that the important part of the narrative is not necessarily colonization. It is a theme. It is a dynamic and engrossing narrative, but it is a means to an end. It is just a storytelling device with a lot going on, a lot of it excellent, but not really good for discourse. Part of why I wanted to make this video is because I felt like, on the one hand, I feel that the overuse of certain political and social justice terms do not really do justice to the complicated narratives. I do not like the idea that we need to stop the show and be like, okay, this character is not a Nazi, we're just using this little bit of symbolism here because you know subtextually what this means. It's a symbol. If we're gonna do these deep dives about these topics, we should also be interrogating the lens from which we also see things. Even as people of color, for those of us who have grown up in the West, whether that be in the United States, Canada, the UK, what else is West? Australia, which is technically the West, even though don't really make sense because we have grown up with certain images of these narratives and we should interrogate that. We also need to be conscious of the bad faith takes and critiques that we give to marginalized creators, especially in comparison to non-marginalized ones. Like it is absurd to me that people are this harsh with Rebecca Sugar and then J.K. Rowling got to do whatever she did for like the longest time. Remember when people thought that liking Harry Potter meant that you weren't gonna vote for Trump? And now we know that J.K. Rowling is a turf and she's just being a mess as she has always been. On the surface, her series seems to be addressing racism. We, and I use the collective royal we because I did it too because I was a kid, we gave it so much praise. But when you actually look at the world building in Harry Potter, you see it don't make no sense. J.K. Rowling has no idea how structural racism works, <laughs> and it shows. Also, for the record, for anyone who's always like, how can you be non-white and be a Southern? Okay, I'll tell you how. Self-preservation hits differently when you colonize an enslaved Slytherin rights. On the flip side, I do think creators, if they are going to dip their toe in imperialism their narratives and imagery, they should be aware that it causes this kind of confusion, especially in the Twitter, Tumblr era, Twitter, Tumblr era, that people legitimately think that you are creating narratives that say, if you are nice to Nazis, they will stop being Nazis. You should be concerned about that. At least to make sure that you know that that is part of what happens when you talk about these things so kind of laissez-faire-ly. In a conversation with a good friend of mine, she brought up how a lot of people lean into this ultimate big bad narrative because it gives them some comfort that it is a special kind of evil we are free from that creates this kind of totalitarian, fascist, authoritarian person. The danger is that we know from literally all of history that that is not the case. But I do think it's important that when we talk about colonization and imperialism that we do so with the consciousness of knowing that these issues are still actively a part of our world. My father is older than the length of time his country has been independent. This is the reality for a lot of us and we do not have control over that. 
you know, even if you want to take it away from sort of black and brown countries, look at Ireland. Look what's happening with Brexit, okay? That is also the shadow of empire. We are constantly affected by Western colonization, and when we use it so laissez-faire in our narratives, often without understanding the repercussions of what these realities look like, and not to say that you can't ever do this. There's a reason to, to do it. There's a point of making these narratives. But you have to really understand these issues beyond, oh, that looks cool. Oh, it'll be epic. Especially because a lot of the time, these shows will appropriate the stories of brown people and just make it about a white guy. There's a reason why there's a white guy who's your protagonist and not, say, a Freeman or someone who is brown. There is intent to what you are doing. I also want people to understand that when we use fandom as a way of discerning people's uh, sort of like morality, it's inherently problematic, especially if we're doing so with white text. I cannot tell you how frustrating it is to see people talk about like, if you like about like Zutara, you know, there was a there thread going around that I thought was interesting, but they're talking about how they feel like Aang got with Katara because if she got with Zuko, it would be enforcing some kind of colonist narrative. I think it's interesting in the metatextual examination of it. I don't begrudge it that. However, it's like, if this narrative really cared about colonization, they would have just gotten rid of the Fire Nation at the end of the series. Because that makes sense. Why are you out here? As I said before, I don't expect everyone to agree on me with this topic. It's a very broad topic. It's got a lot of layers and dingers to it. We all have to, to see how we feel. What I wanted to encourage in this video was just to ask bigger, better questions. If we're gonna have discourse about these heavy topics, these issues that affect so many people from across the world, we should do so empathetically, smartly, and knowing what the words we are saying means. We cannot just put labels onto people completely based on a show. When energy comes forward, yes, you know, there's a reason why we attack certain ships, some certain ships be acting wild out here in these streets. However, it is important to not make these overgeneralizations about what messages are trying to be said and not, especially when the creators are white. Sometimes we have to look deeper into a text, maybe even deeper than the writers did, if we're really gonna talk about what these things mean. So ultimately, what I would say is ask questions, interrogate, debate, have discourse, fight each other about how you think. Do you think Cordex should have died? Go off, we can discuss. But when you say that I am or pro-colonization or that I support imperialism because I like Zutara, those are not just silly to say, but they are fundamentally based on a show created by two white men that doesn't even interrogate the colonization that it created in its own text. But yeah, if you like this, please like, subscribe, uh, support me on Patreon. I think we've hit 50, so we're about to do like an audience poll, and I try to do some exclusive fun content on there, working on getting some more stuff up there, so if you're looking at it and you're like, I don't see shit that I want, girl, I get it. Um, but thank you so much for supporting me. Uh, have a great day, stay indoors, be safe, and ask better questions. We're all better if we do that. Hey everyone, it was so interesting editing this video with all the time between when I actually filmed it to now with the protests going on, with the taking down of statues, with the JK Rowling showing her whole turfness. It was really interesting and I really enjoyed making this video. There's a lot of things that I cut and like added and then cut again. So I will be putting a addendum version of this up on YouTube later, but I really hope you guys enjoyed this video. It was truly a labor of love.